Hello and welcome to this video lecture on International Human Resource Management. This video serves as a very brief overview of some key terms and critical concepts in the application of HR principles to an international context. As more and more American businesses seek opportunities abroad, it is important to understand international issues in HRM. There are some differences in the various HR functions for firms that operate solely in the U.S and those that operate in both the U.S. as well as other countries. For example, recruitment is different because not everyone wants to move to another country, but some people actually actively seek such opportunities. Compensation can be very different for U.S.-based employees and expatriates or expats, which is what we refer to America's, Americans working in other countries. Training programs for international assignment go beyond just instructional issues like machine operation, remedial math, etc. The dynamics of cross-cultural interaction can be vital to the success of an overseas venture. It's not just dollars and cents. It's culture, people, laws, norms, etc. Let's get started. Firms' overseas efforts can be categorized along two dimensions. The first dimension is local responsiveness. This is the degree to which a firm can adapt its policies and products to local demands, customs, and trends. Sometimes this is easier said than done, and other times it is absolutely essential for organizational success. The other dimension is global efficiency, which is the degree to which a firm can compete and provide low-cost goods and services internationally. A company classified as international has low local responsiveness and low global efficiency. A global firm has low local responsiveness and high global efficiency. A multinational organization has high local responsiveness and low global efficiency. A company classified as transnational has high local responsiveness and high global efficiency. So here they are on the graph, G, T, I, and M. It appears that the end goal is to be a transnational firm. Not so fast. As with any management issue, it depends. It depends upon the goals of the firm, the product or service the firm offers, the ability to attract applicants and hire good employees, etc. There's no such thing as an evolution of the firm from, say, international to global or multinational to transnational. These are just four types of overseas ventures categorized along two dimensions. Let's move on. Here are some key terms that you need to know before we proceed. An expatriate is a citizen of one country who is working abroad in one of the company's international offices. For example, an American working for Walmart in another country like Germany or South Africa. A host country national is a native of the country in which an American firm is doing business. For example, a German working in Germany for Walmart, which is an American company. A third country national is a native of a country other than America or the host country. Third country nationals are technically expats to their own country. Here's an example. A South African working in Germany for Walmart, an American company. A staffing policy is concerned with the selection of employees for particular jobs. It is a guiding philosophy regarding the corporate culture and employee placement abroad. A corporate culture is the organization's norms and value systems. These usually emanate from the host country, but can vary when a home country firm expands into other countries. For example, Walmart culture in America has a consistent culture, but when in other countries, it, mean, it maintains much of the American norms and values, but incorporates aspects of the host country as well. Let's move on. There are three main types of staffing policies which companies use to guide their approach regarding who they hire or transfer to work overseas. 
An ethnocentric approach to staffing overseas assignments is when all key management positions are filled by citizens from the parent company's home country. Advantages of this policy include the ability to overcome a lack of qualified individuals in the other country. It also allows for a unified corporate culture, which ensures that the shared values, norms, and traditions of a company are continued abroad. It also allows for a transfer of core competencies when home country nationals move overseas to work for the home country company. Disadvantages include the fact that it can produce resentment amongst locals and it induces cultural myopia, which is a short-sightedness that does not allow for the identification of cultural problems abroad. A polycentric approach to staffing is when host country employees manage the offices in their own country and employees from the parent company's home country manage key positions at home country headquarters. Some advantages are that it alleviates cultural myopia because the host country employees are intimately familiar with the culture of the host country and violations of norms, values, and traditions are not likely. Another advantage is that it is, it is inexpensive to implement because cross-cultural training for home country nationals can be expensive. And in addition, host country nationals tend to get paid less than home country nationals. Usually, that is, unless the host country is Luxembourg or Switzerland or some such. Some disadvantages include that it can limit career mobility in that an international firm often values willingness of employees to work in another country. In some companies, it is actually essential that they do that if they wish to advance in the company. Another disadvantage is that it can isolate headquarters from foreign offices, and this disconnect can be fatal to success. A geocentric approach uses the best people, regardless of nationality, who are sought for key jobs throughout the company. Some advantages include that it allows the company to make the best use of its human resources. That is, the best person gets the job no matter where they are from or where the position is. Another advantage is that it helps build a strong corporate culture and an informal management network. If the culture values say merit, then this approach is the right one. Some disadvantages include the fact that national immigration policies may limit its implementation and it may be expensive to actually implement. You recall I said there were three types of staffing policies. Recently, a fourth has been added, and that is a regiocentric approach, which is similar to a geocentric approach in that managers are from a wider pool, but only from the particular geographic region. Some advantages include the fact that it facilitates interaction between regional managers and home country nationals. Another advantage is that it reflects some sensitivity to local conditions. Some disadvantages include the fact that it can constrain the company from developing a truly global perspective by facilitating a sort of federalism for regional headquarters. Another disadvantage is that although it improves career prospects for managers, it does somewhat constrain them to the regional level. Let's move on. It is vital to recognize the differences between cultures. Culture is a set of shared norms, values, and traditions. These things change over time, but only do so very, very slowly. Culture is important to people, and most members of a culture take great pride in their culture. So understanding cultural differences is important to not violating norms, values, and traditions of a host culture. Such violations can lead to expatriate failure. The U.S. has a very individualistic and low power distance culture. That means that the rights of individuals are often the rights of individuals often supersede those of the group, and a win-lose attitude is typically tolerated or even expected. As a low power distance culture, it is expected that anyone can question anyone who is in a position of authority anytime for any reason. 
For example, it's not uncommon for a lower level employee to ask the CEO questions that would never be asked of a CEO by a lower level employee in a high power distance culture. A legacy of the U.S. low power distance culture is that we are often fond of saying anyone can become president of the United States. Just look at Abraham Lincoln, who was raised in a log cabin with a dirt floor. He became president. So can you. So persons holding a position of power are rarely seen as infallible. Most European countries have a strong emphasis on social responsibility. In Germany, for example, it is common for boards of directors to have equal numbers of shareholder and employee representatives. In America, the emphasis is less on employees and more on owners. In Japan, age and seniority are important. They are not a youth-obsessed culture and have seniority, having seniority is typically recognized and respected. Other countries have more of a youth focus and old people are often shunned as being out of touch or irrelevant. That's sort of sad for a senior citizen like myself. Oh, well. Now, this doesn't mean that people can't change and accept new cultures. The U.S. is the most culturally, ethnically, and racially heterogeneous country in the world. The influx of cultures brought here by immigrants and foreign workers is not without problems, but it is generally seen as a strength of the United States and sets up our expats to favorably perform in overseas assignments because of an awareness of their ability to adapt and change and to accept persons who are different than them. Let's move on. Human resource managers have the tendency to believe an employee's domestic success will equal their overseas success. For expats, many times, the opposite of success is actually more important than success. That is, the avoidance of expat failure is the goal. Expatriate failure is an early return from an overseas assignment. This early return can come at the request of the expat who is living abroad, or it can be a function of being recalled by the employing firm. Either one is bad and both cost money. Thus, the identification of those least likely to fail is usually the goal. So domestic and overseas success are not the same thing. They're different because the employee may have problems adapting to a different cultural setting. Certainly, there is a positive correlation between domestic and overseas success, But it is far less than a perfect 1.0 because of the many, many additional issues with relocating to a foreign country. For domestic employees voluntarily or involuntarily terminated, there is an associated expense, but the cost of placing an employee and their families overseas is very expensive. We want expat success, and sometimes job performance is secondary to actually just avoiding expat failure. Think about that for a moment. Expats and home country managers share some similar requirements such as technical competence, professional experience, and interpersonal skills. Selection testing for expatriate managers going abroad is different than for home country managers. Expats who are successful typically have some international experience already. It's super helpful if they have some experience in the particular country where they're being placed too. Prior language skills go a long way towards ensuring success. Lastly, the flexibility of the family is imperative. This is not something usually required of home country managers. And in most situations, asking about one's family is frowned upon. Think for a minute about the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. If a female manager is hired at home, HR managers are not allowed to ask about future family expansion plans. If they're going abroad, it is important that the potential expat be informed of all available assistance for their family without prying too much or discriminating against them if they have a family, if they have a large family, or if they plan on starting a family. Let's move on. As previously noted, 
Having some language skills in the tongue of the host country is a giant plus. However, the company may be expanding into a country where a little-known language is spoken, and just about anyone assigned there would need some significant language training. However, most companies do not expand to vastly different countries than their home country, and language training may be necessary for the expat manager and their family. Helping a manager's family fit in is vital to the manager's success. There's also likely to be some cultural training necessary to involve things like nonverbal communication, behavioral norms, respectful observation of traditions, etc. Both language and cultural training will help offset the possibility of culture shock. If going from a first world country to a third world country can be completely disorganized and disoriented, think about how it works for even the hardiest of traveler. Think for a second about being asked to uproot from, say, suburban Dallas, Texas to rural northern Nigeria. In some third world countries, the provision of water and electricity is sporadic at best. The typical suburbanite might find that shocking. Let's move on. Compensation for expats is usually very different from home country managers. First, expats are usually provided with some incentive pay that serves as a bonus for leaving the U.S., but it also helps maintain the same standard of living as at home. The goal is to never see the standard of living decrease without major incentives. For example, an expat in northern rural Nigeria may never be able to have the same standard of living as they did in suburban Dallas, but some hefty incentive pay in the bank can sometimes ease that burden. In most countries, the expat would pay income tax there and at home. This sort of double whammy, so to speak, is usually covered by the company sending the expat abroad. In some countries, the education system is better than in the U.S., but in most, it is not. The company must find a suitable way to make sure the expat's children are properly educated. For example, I have an aunt and uncle who once were sent to live in Botswana. Their children, that is my cousins, my first cousins, were sent to boarding school in Johannesburg, South Africa, at company expense. Another compensation issue is regarding the coverage of occasional trips home. Depending upon where the assignment is located, this can be very expensive for the company. But absence does make the heart grow fonder, so an occasional visit home can offset culture shock in many instances. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now. 